lot of times we just get approached to play festivals or conventions or we'll apply to play to play for festivals or conventions where we know that our audience will already be um so honestly we're kind of taking a shortcut version of developing our audience by doing it this way we were building an audience without having to put forth um, the marketing effort that mm. you would need to otherwise. They start asking us to come back rather than us asking to come play. Welcome to the Gamer Symphony Dreams podcast, where we invite you to join us for an interesting and meaningful conversation on video game orchestras and video game music. Welcome to the Gamer Symphony Dreams podcast. My name is Michelle Ng, and I'm the host of the show. Today, I'm here with Robert Luke Martin, the music director of the Irish Video Game Orchestra. Welcome, Robert. Hey. Hey. So we're just going to get right into it. Um, today, we're going to talk about your background. We're going to talk about the Irish Video Game Orchestra. So what is your background, and how did you get into video game music? Um, my background is as a classically trained musician. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I was, uh, I grew up as a musician, uh, was in every band, choir, orchestra, uh, growing up, uh, outside of Washington, DC. Um, and then trained as a, uh, pipe organist in my undergrad. Mm -hmm. Uh, from there, uh, eventually went on and, uh, became a conductor, uh, and trained as a conductor. In graduate school um, getting into video game music I didn't really um, I didn't really get into video game music until after college um, mm -hmm. during college I kind of I dug into um, Irish traditional music oh, in okay. undergrad and then um, it wasn't until after college where I was uh, you know in that that mindset of trying to find a job after college mm -hmm. that actually was in my field um, that during while waiting for all of those job applications to come back, um, I started gaming again, and uh, it was a uh, playthrough of Legend of Zelda: Twilight Princess that a friend of mine had given me. Um, a friend of mine from college, she had just gotten her Wii U, and she's just like, "Hey, you want my old Wii?" And I'm like, "Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do actually," <laughs> um, and sent Twilight Princess with it, and. Um, then kind of uh, hearing that soundtrack and then uh, digging through the internet for a while and finding all the uh, the budding video game music community that was growing at the time, uh, I kind of just dove in head first after that. Wow. So you saw these, you know, people doing these video game, you know, video game music online and then you're like, hey, I want to be part of that. Yeah. And this was actually all around the same time that the... Um, the Zelda Symphony started touring. It was all the about that goddesses. time. Of, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, even before, there was the 25th anniversary one that toured oh, before okay. Symphony of the Goddesses. Yeah. So that had just come out. Um, and so everything kind of just lined up perfect the right timing. way. Yeah. <laughs> everything was... Yeah. Exactly. It was just perfect timing. So then you started the uh, Irish Video Game Orchestra. So you founded the group and you're the, the, you're the music director. Um, what is the origin story behind this orchestra and why did you create it? Um, yeah, so uh, I was working on my master's degree in arts management at Queen's University in Belfast, Northern Ireland. And while I was there, um, unlike here in the States where most of our uh, gaming and anime conventions are run by large corporations or uh, non-profit organizations mm -hmm. over there um, in Ireland most of the gaming conventions are actually run by clubs within the universities oh, okay. and so the biggest one is actually done by a group called Dragon Slayers at Queens mm -hmm. and that is a QCon Queens convention it makes sense um, <laughs> but so there's this is the biggest in Ireland um, and so uh, I got involved with the organization for a while, um, just attending meetings, kind of hanging out, um, and pitched the idea of a, hey, why don't we get the university orchestra and let's do a concert as part of the convention. Mm -hmm. The university orchestra said no, um, <laughs> which is 
kind of funny to me. But at the time, I was um, the music director of the chamber orchestra at the university as well. Um, and so my musicians from that orchestra basically failed terrifically. Um, <laughs> at no fault of my own, I will say. Um, but the, uh, the music musicians had um, heard about the video game music idea and really wanted to get involved. And so we kind of built a new orchestra around that, around this uh, single performance or this one weekend of performances um, at this convention that happened in June. Um, and then from there, it just kind of, everybody had a great time. Everybody loved doing it to the point where we were invited back the next year. And then other conventions started asking us to come. And then from there, we kind of decided, okay, this is going to be a, a real thing. Let's uh, let's start organizing and actually making this a full-time uh, organization. Mm -hmm. So it kind of started out from like the QCon, but then evolved into its its own organization. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so and and the, you're the music director. So as a conductor, um wanted to ask you about, you know, you pursued uh master's degrees in both uh, arts management and conducting. Um what led you to pursue those um areas and what have you learned by studying both? Oh man. Yeah. Um well, coming I I started conducting orchestras in undergrad. Um at Houghton College up in uh, Western New York, um, and and actually auditioned for a good number of graduate conducting programs right out of college, mm -hmm. um, and then also the year after college applied to a bunch and uh, didn't get in um, because uh, they are extremely competitive programs to uh, to get into, and if you don't have you know a few years experience beforehand, they're they're going to be very hesitant to let you in. Mm -hmm. to the program um so after getting the next round of um thanks but no thanks letters mm -hmm. um i was i was like okay what am i doing now like trying to figure out what my next steps were going to be and um just on a whim i thought you know i'm gonna look at schools in europe and see what's uh see what's going on over there and just you know i've mm -hmm. always i I've been wanting to move over to Europe for a while. I um, One of my first um, graduate auditions was at the Royal Conservatory in Scotland. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, I've been trying to make my way over there for a while um, and found programs at Trinity College and at Queen's University, um, both in arts management. And this was a field I was thinking about moving into uh, after not being successful as a conductor right mm -hmm. away. Um, and so uh, seeing those programs and seeing that their deadlines weren't, uh, hadn't been passed yet, their application deadlines in Europe are very late, mm -hmm. um, I thought, okay, I'll apply and just see what happens. And um, interview got asked to interview for both, both uh, programs and then uh, got accepted into Queens. And then uh, from there, it was just, uh, you know, a crazy, uh, crazy adventure of picking up and moving to uh to another country um so that's what led me to arts management and then after that um because your student visa only lasts for so long um mm -hmm. and unable to not not unable to find a job but just certain circumstances had me come back to the states um mm -hmm. mostly a number of weddings i had to go to mm -hmm. <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, it caused me to move back to um, move back to the U.S. and um, from there I was working in a couple of places and wasn't really finding direction again. Mm. As it happens when you live in the suburbs of any large uh, U.S. <laughs> city, um, and then uh, after working at a church as an organist and music director for uh, a couple of years, I'm like, you know, I kind of want to go back and see if I can get into a conducting program again. Mm -hmm. And um, the problem is I decided this uh, about midway through December. Mm -hmm. And as any musician will know, the deadline for most uh, music applications, especially for grad school, is December 1st. Mm -hmm. 
So at that point, I was just looking through, um, okay, what grad schools offer a decent conducting program that haven't closed their application process yet? Mm-hmm. And at that point, I'm like, you know, I kind of want to move to California. I want to mm-hmm. get involved with the industry out there and see what happens. Yeah. And luck be, luck be held, luck be told. <laughs> there's a there's an idiom there that I can't remember right now. Um, uh, the Bob Cole Conservatory of Music at Cal State Long Beach still had their application process open, and I'm just like, that sounds good. Yeah, <laughs> I've heard I've heard decent things about that school, and popped in my application. Uh, got a phone call saying, hey, we want you, but I'm actually the wind band conductor, not the not the orchestra conductor, and I'm like, uh. I signed up for orchestra. What's going on? <laughs> oh, he's busy. Also, you don't want to study with him. You want to study with me. Oh. <laughs> and I'm just like, okay. Looked up the guy and I'm like, oh, yeah, I do want to study with him. <laughs> that, yeah. Okay. I'm down. And, um, and I mean, everything is really, it's transferable either way. Instrumental conducting is instrumental conducting. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, that's what brought me up to California. And I've been here for three and a half years now um Mm -hmm. and desperately trying to get back to ireland uh full time but that's a story for another day or maybe later later on in the list (laughs) yeah so um what kind of things did you did you learn in your conducting program um i mean there's there's a number of things a lot of it is um a lot of a conductor's job is score study Mm -hmm. and uh rehearsals Mm-hmm. Those are the two biggest jobs of a conduct of a conductor, and I think that most people who attend a con just attend concerts but aren't involved in music don't really see that and don't understand yeah. that that the conductor's job is ninety five percent before you get to the concert hall, um, mm-hmm. and so a lot of our a lot of the work was doing score study, um, doing a lot of uh, music history uh, music history study, um, and. Um, uh, yeah, and a lot of rehearsal techniques. And I apologize now if you're catching any of the symbols that are coming from across the house. We are a house of gigging musicians. <laughs> and That's all right. My, room, my roommate is uh, recording for a uh, brass band project right now that he's a percussionist for. So I'm, I'm hearing some crash symbols or oh, ride symbols. We're good. But it'll be fine. It's part. We're all musicians. It's chill. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, so most of it, it was, um, was yeah, rehearsal technique and score study. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you have the baton technique and, like, actually, like, okay, how do you physically lead, lead a group? Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was some arranging and orchestrating because both me and my, uh, main, my main teacher uh, worked in those areas. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, uh, those, are, those are, like, the things that you mainly get taught in in the school but then really the part of the program that's the most important is how do you take the resources that you have available to you and make something of it and go beyond the program Mm -hmm. so yeah and um you started did you start the studio orchestra at um the conservatory i did yeah okay um can you just briefly uh talk about that like yeah, so the whole idea behind that group was basically there's one, there are two orchestras at the conservatory already. There's the symphony orchestra that does the major works that um, all the string player, all the string majors apply for and get into and um, will audition and get in, into. Uh, and then there's what's called beach orchestra, which is kind of like the orchestra version of concert band. Mm-hmm. Um, which so then uh, that being like the oh anybody can join this is like the fun group where we just kind of we do one concert a semester we're just kind of here to have fun but also mm-hmm. learn and it's a lot of like um, it's a lot of like music ed majors who are working on secondary instruments and uh, mm. just players from other parts of campus and that kind of thing and they'll focus they'll do some of the fun pop stuff sometimes but usually they're like the really bad Hal Leonard arrangements or whatever that you find. <laughs> Um, that are made very accessible for for high school and middle school groups. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sitting there going, you know, we are 20 minutes away from downtown Los Angeles. We are in a huge uh, recording industry 
area, why are we not um, taking advantage of this? Mm -hmm. um, and why aren't we teaching our students how to like actually function within this environment? Um, and so my whole idea was we're going to do the music that you will probably 95% chance that you will encounter this music in your professional career but you're not getting taught how to do it and you're not being you're not getting the experience you need before you ha you run into it uh, here at the school so basically we we do all the weird stuff I mean we did we there's always at least one video game concert per year just because that's what we do um, we did an anime show we did a show with a rock band uh, mm -hmm. playing with us we did a show that um, a show uh, that celebrated the music from Steven Universe mm -hmm. um, we do uh, live to film um, concerts so like everybody having a click track in their ear and we are uh, playing live to the to the screen above us type of a thing uh, we did some recording sessions for um, the film music group, or the film mm. music class on campus. Um, so it was a lot of like, here's the other side of the orchestra industry mm -hmm. that you are going to see, and you need to you need to have some experience in, mm -hmm. um, because guaranteed, at least half of the students coming out of that school will be a session musician mm -hmm. at some point. Well, so you, you basically like kind of pioneered that and you kind of foresaw that there was like this need that maybe the school didn't offer and you went out mm -hmm. and said, hey, even though I'm studying under a wooden band conductor, I'm still going to conduct this orchestra, but like that's related to what's happening in the industry in LA. Yeah. Yeah. And it got to the point where we even had faculty playing with us because they're, oh, like, that's this awesome. is, they're like, this is cool. Why? Like our, our, um, faculty advisor is the um, assistant department chair at the school. Oh, wow. And she's just like, <laughs> yeah, I'm coming in. I'm, I mean, she's <laughs> she's professional enough that she doesn't have to come to our regular rehearsals. She, mm -hmm. she's, we'll send her the music ahead, and we know she'll actually practice. Um, <laughs> and then she'll roll in for the dress rehearsal and then the actual show. And, um, and she does great, as wow. always. that's so, awesome to hear. Yeah. Um, what would you say are the, the most important things that you learned when you were doing uh, arts in terms of arts management? Uh, first thing is budgeting and how to find money. Um, especially the big difference though, okay. The arts management course I took there is very European mm -hmm. uh, centered. So unlike here in the United States, the governments in Europe actually provide funding for the arts. Mm. Like it's a it's a much different it's a much different um, monster over there than it is here. Mm -hmm. um, so the big thing for them is writing grants to local arts bodies, city councils, um, uh, counties, that kind of thing, to find funding from taxpayers. Mm -hmm. We're here in the states. The NEA is a thing, the National Endowment for the Arts, and that does typically get eventually filtered out to arts councils for people to apply for grants. But really, if we are looking for funding here, it mostly comes from private donors mm -hmm. here in the States. Um, and so because of that, it kind of just the whole process, the whole thing is just a whole, it's a different thing. It's different. Honestly. Um, but yeah, finding money was a big thing. Um, the other thing is um, interacting with your audience and how to develop it properly. Mm -hmm. So how to find an audience that, um, that you have a niche project for, a niche project for, mm -hmm. um, that hasn't been tapped yet, and how then to develop that audience into repeat consumers. Mm -hmm. And those are, those are the two big things, because if you don't have funding, you will never get started. And if you don't have repeat consumers, then what's the point? Mm -hmm. Um, my, uh, my approach to managing the arts is, is it marketable? Um, anytime that, uh, I've got composer friends who are constantly writing music and, and yes, there is value to arts for art's sake, but at a certain mm -hmm. point you need to ask, is it marketable? Mm -hmm. Is there a, is there a market for this to be consumed? 
if the answer mm -hmm. is yes, then great, let's make it happen. If the answer is no, okay, it probably will become marketable at some point. So I mean, there's there's always a point to doing it. And like I said, there's there is value to arts for art's sake, but at some mm -hmm. point you gotta do something in order to continue making that art. You yeah. gotta do something that is marketable in order to do it, so. Yeah, so what would you say is, um, well, how do you develop or how do you develop an audience or find people who are interested that's untapped? Yeah, um, well, with the Irish Video Game Orchestra, we find most of our audiences are um, either giant nerds, which is <laughs> great, um, or families. Those are our two big things. Um, and depending on where where we're playing, we tailor our show to either be family friendly or more geared to like um, college age students. And it depends on, like I said, it depends on where we're playing. Um, okay. But with those those two groups are actually very different um, mm -hmm. in terms of how you market to them and how you uh, interact with them. Because really, in one case, you're interacting with parents. Mm -hmm. In another case, you're ad you're interacting with adolescents. Um, and so with both of them, it's kind of like, okay, how do we keep providing content and keeping them involved in order to do, you know, this, these dual, um, uh, communities, uh, interacting with us. So, um, the best way for us, and this is of course all pre-coronavirus, um, the best way that we've been able to do that is to be performing at places where these people are, uh, typically found. So, um, unlike most of the video game orchestras that float around here, um, we don't produce our own shows, or at least we haven't produced our own show in two years. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea behind that is, um, we've gotten to the point where we are so busy from people contracting us in for their gigs, for their shows, their conventions, their festivals, that, um, we haven't we literally do not have the time for our musicians to add additional shows that we are putting on ourselves. Okay, so those are not shows you're you're doing yourself. It's more like people want you to play at their event. Yeah, it's it's like um, it's literally us. We literally get contracted in. So, or we find a way to get in. My my operations manager is very good at writing a persuasive email, <laughs> um, and he'll find a way that if there's a big event coming to the area, he'll find a way to get us involved somehow. So like the big one from last year where he really, really twisted the arm of the, uh, <laughs> the organization. Uh, the organizer was uh, uh, Dublin Worldcon, which is the science fiction convention. Mm -hmm. And it's the, it's, the, it's the world science fiction convention that travels from city to city every year. And <laughs> So last year it was in Dublin and I'm just like, oh guys, this is, this is happening. We should, we should go like, just, we should attend. We should see what's going on. Oh no. My operations manager emails someone's going. So we have a performance slot on Saturday at this time. Um, and also by the way, we're playing at the Hugo awards that night, which is like the science fiction Oscars basically. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, how did you do that? How did you figure that one out? So, um, yeah, so beyond that, um, a lot of times we just get approached to play festivals for conventions or we'll apply to, apply to play for festivals for conventions where we know that our audience will already be. Um, so, honestly, we're kind of taking a shortcut version of developing our audience right now. Okay, so it sounds like some of those are like, you know there's events going on you like and you pitch yourselves to see if they might be interested in having you yeah yeah like for instance like there we played a family fe family friendly festival called the east side festival in belfast last summer um and that festival t is like four weekends over a month and it's all f it's like circus and music mm -hmm. acts and it's all very family friendly um and so we uh we got pitched into that and um and they were also looking into asking us anyway so it kind of worked out really well um 
and then uh, like there's another festival called the Stenthal Festival, which is out in a farm in the middle of nowhere, and um, they kind of we that's one that you always apply for to uh, be a musician at. Um, mm. But that one's also even though it's a it is a music festival, it's also another family oriented festival um, that we knew that. Um, audiences that we have already come across would be at so it was just another oh, way okay. of us being like hey we know that we're a draw i mean we're being we can be a little a little um uh a little full of ourselves and be like we kind of know we're a big deal but we also know we take up a lot of stage space so we understand if you say no but <laughs> we know that we can like we can pull a crowd every once in mm -hmm. a while at these things um which we tend to do. So, I mean, it's, it's always been like, um, it's always been a very, very interesting process. Um, and it's kind of like by doing it this way, we were building an audience without having to put forth, um, the marketing effort that mm. you would need to otherwise by performing at places that are already looking for performers to do it mm -hmm. and places where we have, we have now, built connections over a number of years that mm -hmm. um, they start asking us to come back rather than us asking to come play. Okay, that's that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I think you mentioned before that um, your orchestra is, you guys are a um, community orchestra, is that right? Mm hmm And you actually tour on the weekends. Is that is that correct? Yeah, so... Um, just like any event planning we we know our we know our performance dates well in advance um and if someone can't make that show that's fine we'll make it work type of a thing so mm -hmm. like um we had a, a trumpet player who couldn't make it to a show in cork and i know not many people know the uh the uh, geography of ireland but mm -hmm. belfast is all the way up in the northeast corner and Cork is about south central, like on the opposite side of the island, mm -hmm. which, yeah, that's a trip. That That is a weekend trip for a lot of our players, and not everyone could make it, which is fine. We made it work um, to the point where we actually we picked up a couple of trombone players in Cork who were just like, yeah, we'll comply. Oh, that's cool. Okay, cool. Come to the rehearsal beforehand, and then we'll do a show. We had a trumpet player join us. Um, we have a really good relationship with what's called the cross-border orchestra of ireland um mm -hmm. so just here's the here's the background ireland is two countries technically the island is there's northern ireland which is part of the united kingdom and then there's the republic of ireland which is the ireland everyone thinks of when you hear ireland um and so there's the there's this uh youth orchestra that does a bunch of performances around the island that uses musicians from both the north and the south um and as this big like cross-border um everyone together kind of a thing and it's a huge huge event that happens over the summer and they play they sell out arenas for multiple nights in a row they're they're mm -hmm. massive it's incredible um and one of their trumpet instructors is actually one of our trumpet players um oh, so cool. if we're missing yeah so if we need a an instrument type or something in a certain area of the island he's able to like contact somebody and be like hey we need trombone players in cork who's around, who's available, does anybody know anybody? Um, mm -hmm. And most of the time, um, a lot of these ringers that we bring in when we need to, um, they don't want to be paid, which is really nice. Mm. They're just kind of like, oh yeah, we're here for the crack. And in mm -hmm. Ireland, crack means, you know, just for the fun of it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's part of that novelty of playing video game music. Like, how often do you get to play something so epic in, yeah. in, a, in an old, like, banquet hall? in uh, an ancient university in cork like how often do you get to do that like this is a this is like a once or twice in a lifetime opportunity yeah we'll just come along and play and see what happens so that sounds fun um, yeah it's 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 a community group but it really like it shines through a lot when the time mm -hmm. comes it's it's really interesting to see yeah i mean I, I i've seen some of your videos and they look very professional so um it's impressive that you can go on tour and because I I've talked to some other people who are part part of community orchestras and they want to go on tour and they're thinking oh how how are we going to do that but it sounds like they can mm -hmm. find some opportunities maybe just on the weekends at some of these festivals yeah I mean 
start small and work your way up is really yeah. the way to do it. Yeah. Um, and obviously all of our tours, I mean, Ireland is not a big island. It's a six hour drive from the top to the bottom. Um, so, I mean, we can drive one morning, get to wherever we need to on the island, do a show that night, stay over and drive back the next day. It's really not that difficult. Um, mm -hmm. We are looking at doing a more extended tour in the future, like over to over to Great Britain or even further into Europe. Um, we we like to joke about doing an American tour at some point, but <laughs> who knows when that's happening? Yeah. Um, but really, I think the other part of it is we we try to keep our organization flexible mm -hmm. and our orchestra flexible, so that we have performance opportunities like. The, that show in Dublin at Worldcon, we took what's called our uh, quintet plus, as we call it. So it's a string quintet plus whatever instruments we need to add in for the mm -hmm. show that we're doing. Um, and so instead of taking you know our 35-piece orchestra down to Dublin, we took a group of five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of us, I think, mm -hmm. down to Dublin. Um, and can still put on a very a very solid show um, based on the rep that we have. So we're able to adapt our repertoire to what we to our personnel needs. Mm -hmm. We're able to adapt our personnel to the venue needs and we're able to then adapt um, our show down to whatever they're able to do, whether it be based off of their budget or their um, their venue space or whatever um mm -hmm. i think the the biggest part of it is being able to be flexible do you um do you have to redo the arrangement so if it's a smaller group um we have done that um and now we also have like we also have a repertoire that is written specifically for our smaller groups okay um and that's also kind of one of the things that we've been working on over coronavirus time um we are looking at okay what other kind of small groups can we create mm -hmm. that will um that we're starting to find a um new markets for basically mm -hmm. so we're talking like okay well obviously we need to do an irish traditional group that plays video game music like imagine imagine a a, a group that you would hear in an irish bar playing like all the village tunes from zelda like mm -hmm. how can you not um <laughs> We, I want to do like something that's like more rock band related kind of a group, mm -hmm. but still throw in like some brass and some strings here and there type of a thing. So um, yeah, we we adapt our music to what we need, and but we also have rep that's already written just for that those groups. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's fantastic. Um, so can uh, I was wondering about your concert production and promotion i know you talked a little bit about how you don't have to do too much of your own marketing because you're just trying to um go to these festivals or people approach you um but can you talk a little bit about when you do promote yourselves um like what's involved and and also like during the concert production what do you what do you guys do um like uh, you mentioned q labs before so uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about that yeah, so most of our promotion we try and do, I mean, Belfast is a small city. It's not big. Um, so word spreads pretty quickly, which is nice. Um, by doing a lot of our festivals that we've done and a lot of the stuff that we've done, whenever we have something coming out, we can reach out to our friends and our partners that we've worked with mm -hmm. and be like, hey, this is what we're working on. Can you help us spread the news? Because we've already helped them spread whatever they're working on to our, you know, and this is all social media. This is all social media networking. Um, can you help us spread whatever we're working on? And I mean, it's it's such a community within the nerds, but also within the arts that's like, yeah, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. I mean, obviously we will <laughs> we'll help out. Um, we have really great relationships with like the comic book stores and uh, a store called Forbidden Planet, which is um, like a, an overall nerd shop um, mm -hmm. in Belfast. Uh, actually, I think it's all of UK. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. Um, but like we have, we have a, 
we've really worked hard over the last five years to create um, really solid relationships with these organizations and these um, these small businesses that uh, a lot of our marketing is just a matter of contacting people directly and be like, hey, can you help us out? Can we put up some flyers? Can we do this? Can we do that? Can we? And that way we're able to like get right into our, um, our previous audience base. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, of course we have an email mailing list that we never use because we forget we have it, but I think we only have like 130 people on it who would already see anything that we put up on Facebook. So it's really, um, really it's for us in our audience development specifically is all about and well not audience development but our marketing is all about reaching out to our um our already built network and trying to help expand it beyond that mm -hmm. so you guys more rely on like your existing network as opposed to like let's say um like individual donors or something Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, and mostly also because we haven't, we don't have individual donors. Mm. Um, but we've also, we've never received money from the Arts Council either. Mm -hmm. um, all of our funding uh, we've done through all of our gigs, basically. Mm -hmm. um, like the last gig that we, we produced ourselves, we broke even, which was awesome. Not mm -hmm. complaining about that. It was an expensive venue. Um, it looked cool, but it was expensive. <laughs> um, the um, but all of our festivals and uh, conventions, we're paid a fee to play. Mm -hmm. You know, they they're like, here's money for your trouble, and our musicians understand that. You know, that's what keeps us going. That's why we perform, um, or one of the reasons why we perform, and why why we send the small group small group out for things. Um, that the full orchestra doesn't go to it so that we can afford to continue going on. Um, most community groups within Northern Ireland um, actually charge a fee to their musicians to play, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's a studio of symphony orchestra in Belfast, which is kind of like the semi-professional group. Mm -hmm. So there's the Ulster Orchestra, which is like the paid professional orchestra. And then Studio Symphony is kind of like the next tier down where it's a community group, but they're really good and they're mm -hmm. auditioned. And it's like the doctors who used to play or who studied oh, okay. music for a while and it's like you know every doctor is a musician we all know this <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not to be not to say a stereotype but like <laughs> it's true and usually they're better musicians than actual musicians are so um so like that's like that group they're charged a fee to play mm -hmm. like they're they they charge a membership fee so they can keep going mm -hmm. which is understandable um our musicians are all young adults who are either in college, just finished college. I think our old, I mean, we, we do have some like old guys. I mean, Brian is like in his sixties, um, but he's cool. Mm -hmm. We like him. He's our town drunk. Um, he's also the father of one of our trumpet players, so it's fine. Um, but like, we don't charge a fee for our, our musicians. So all of our operating costs come from our profit when we go play these corporate gigs, these festivals and mm -hmm. these um, things. And I forget how I got on this topic, um, but yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know how I got here. <laughs> I forget what the question was. Yeah, something um, about, a con I, I asked about concert production and promotion. Oh. And we ended up talking about fees. Um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's all about creating that network. And thankfully, the art scene in Belfast is such that, you know, we do try to help each other out. Mm -hmm. Because we're constantly, everybody across the board are is always facing, um, constantly facing budget cuts yeah. from, from the Arts Council. Because they're facing budget cuts. So the funding just keeps getting cut further and further. And the only group that keeps going and not having to deal with it is the Ulster Orchestra. And that's another podcast. Um, yeah. So, like, we we try and share resources. We share networks. We, we really do work together to try and keep the arts alive in the city. Which mm -hmm. I think is a, a really nice thing that you will only see in a small city like that. Yeah. Well, it's important to keep the arts alive. Yeah. Definitely. Do you, do you guys do anything special for concert production, like lights, uh, 
video videos or anything like that? Yes. Yeah. So we usually do video playback with our with our music. Um, for this group, we haven't really done anything to click track, but we're talking about it. Um, usually, what happens is we kind of when we edit a video, we put it up against a um, a MIDI mockup of the track that mm. we're working on, and we'll edit it to that music. And then kind of buffer in an extra 20 seconds because we always take it a little bit slower because mm -hmm. that's just how life works. And then so basically um, we use a program called QLab, which is on, uh, I think it's a Mac only program, but it's, um, it's a professional queuing program that um, if you have the right hookups, you can hook up your light cues, your... Uh, video cues, sound cues, everything into this one program, and then all you have to do is hit a space bar and it plays when it needs to. Um, it's an absolute brilliant program, and we use it extensively um, because we're able to then uh, line up all of our videos without having to change any, like, without having to go into other opposite files or whatever when we're playing stuff um, mm -hmm. and just hit oh, our tech guy will be watching and as soon as he sees the downbeat he hits go and everything typically mm -hmm. lines up pretty close um with my with the orchestra here in california where we did start doing click track we also did a lot of stuff with visual click tracks so that in in addition to the giant screen above us we had two monitors one facing me and one facing them where they had the what's called streamers across the video screen that kind of gave mm -hmm. them that kind of showed cues for hits and things like that um, and had a, um, a measure counter and beat counter on it. So we would make sure that like we, we had some flexibility because we didn't have like a sound click going on, mm -hmm. um, but we had like, you know, we knew where the hits were going to be so we could kind of make sure everything still lined up where they needed to line up. Um, so is is that um the the two monitors one is that also um QLab? Yeah. Yeah, so what's great about QLab is as long as you have the right dongles and everything, um you can have as many outputs as you need to as long as you mm -hmm. pay the licensing fee to actually use the the product. Mm -hmm. Um and so what's great then is that um I can then take the the video that's going up on the big screen, make a version of it that has those streamers Mm -hmm. uh, embedded and have them both play and start at the same time so that they are in sync together um, but then what the clean version is on the big screen and then the, the marked up one is in front of us and then to even go further than that if we were using an audio click what we could do is then make the audio of the streamer, the, the visual click, the audio click as well and using the same program pipe everything out into um, monitors, headphone monitors, and that way everything just lines up exactly where it's supposed to go. No matter what, no matter like what video it is, um, what piece it is, as long as like everything, each piece had all the requirements, it, everything would just line up exactly how it's supposed to. Um, okay. So then you're not like going between like three different programs and trying to sync mm -hmm. it all up at the same time. It does it for you. Mm -hmm. And that sounds really convenient for people who might want to think about using video or they're doing like a click track style mm -hmm. of uh, recording. Do you, um, do you, where do you do the recordings for if you're like recording uh, like pieces? Um, like audio pieces? Yeah, let's like say where you're, you record it. Yeah, where do you do audio pieces? Um, when we do recording sessions, we usually do them at in the rehearsal room for for California we do it in our rehearsal room at the school okay. um, it's it's set up for recording as well um, other than that uh, with the Irish video game orchestra all of our recordings have been the kind where everyone gets their parts and they record at home and send it back in type okay. of thing so they'll they'll do their recordings wherever they can find time and space and a quiet place to do it and send it back in and then we'll okay. mess with it until we're happy with it so you don't necessarily have to go to like a recording studio to to do like an album uh, or something no no 
Um, although I will say, shout out to, um, shout out to Citrus College in, um, where is that, Covina? What's, is that Azusa? That might be Azusa. Um, out here in the foothills uh, outside LA, mm -hmm. um, there's a community college that has a state-funded 30-seat um, uh, recording studio. Wow. It is absolutely gorgeous. It is wow. beautiful. It is amazing. And for $1,000, you have it for like 10 hours with oh, an engineer. I think it that's costs, a good deal. It's a great deal. It's an incredible <laughs> deal, especially for California. Like, that's pennies. So, if you're in LA and you need a big space that can fit a small orchestra, Citrus College is where you go. Yeah, Citrus College. That's mm -hmm. that's awesome. <laughs> so, I want to shift uh, focus to talking about um, conducting, since you're a conductor. Okay. Um, so, for aspiring conductors out there, because you've done some conducting workshops where you've helped people improve their conduct conducting technique um what would you say are some of like the biggest mistakes that beginner conductors make and what are some tips with dealing with that oh <laughs> oh i should have read the questions beforehand <laughs> no, i'm kidding um i think the biggest thing is um conducting is kind of like doing a tiktok dance <laughs> where the ones who the ones who do really well on TikTok are the ones who are completely aware of where their body is at all times, right? They understand where their hands need to start, where they end, and the path of motion in order to get there. Um, I think my the biggest um, the biggest hurdle that most people have when starting to conduct, and this is just from um, having to cover some basic conducting courses while I was a grad student, having to cover for my professors, um, the biggest hurdle is um, understanding body control, but then also um, independence of hands mm -hmm. completely. Um, because I mean, most of the conductors who most most of the students who we see come in as conductors who want to be conductors, they were probably a drum major in their high school marching band. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know I was, and you know, drum majors have a very specific way of conducting, because all they are are um, very large visual metronomes, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a very specific form of, of what they're doing. And so kind of like breaking them out of that in order to um, be more expressive mm -hmm. and uh, be able to actually show something beyond time and beat. Um, the first thing that they have to do is crack out of that mirrored, both hands doing the same thing, mirrored all the time. Mm -hmm. That is always the first step. Um, so yeah, I would say that the biggest hurdle or the biggest the biggest problem is uh, not having that independence of hands, um, being able to do something with your left hand while your right hand is doing something else, mm -hmm. being able to go back and forth. Mm -hmm. how, so how do you how do, for the body control aspect? How do you I guess develop that? Um, I mean, a lot of it is just a lot of mirror work like just standing in front of a mirror and working and practicing. Um, there's also, um, you can take body mapping classes, which I regret not taking mm. in grad school because someone offered it and I had signed up and then I dropped it and I didn't go and I regret it. And apparently the professor was really bummed because she's just like, yes, we have a conductor. And then I dropped it and she's like, dang it. <laughs> um, but body mapping is super helpful because it's literally the the learning about where we place our bodies, how we stand, how we, how we, how we use our bodies in motion and how we can use them more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Um, and then other things like other ways to just break out of that is start using your non-dominant hand for things. Like I remember in basic conducting back in undergrad, um, one of the things our professor was like, don't use your dominant hand to eat all week. <laughs> Right, like use your non-dominant hand to to use your fork or whatever. Um, 
try writing more with your left hand or you know just trying to trying to it's it's a matter of strengthening things and trying to like just be completely a, just i don't i don't know i think i'm also weird in the fact that i can just i have weird muscle control that i can just i can isolate a muscle if i need to and like figure out where it is and how to, how to move it in order to do what i need to do that's mm -hmm. why all the all the kids in the archery club hated me because i could do that <laughs> <laughs> okay so it sounds like there's a couple things there that um you know if people are aspiring to become become a conductor those are some things that they should uh, think about and also like practice mm -hmm. yeah definitely yeah um but like out of all that the biggest thing is working in front of a mirror working in front of a mirror do you think it's the most effective absolutely yeah spend some time in your bathroom get vain it's fine <laughs> this is so funny <laughs> so um I want to switch over to, uh, you know, when you were studying in California for your master's in conducting, you were still actually running the Irish video game orchestra from abroad. And this is, I think you're the only person I've heard of who actually ran like an orchestra from abroad. Um, so if so somebody's like thinking of doing something similar, can you share how exactly, how exactly you did that? Um, yeah. So the first, the first step is having an incredible team on the ground there um honestly if they decided to get rid of me they would be fine mm -hmm. <laughs> like they they can still go on without me um yeah the biggest thing is um having having people who are invested enough in order to keep it going while you're not able to physically be there to open up the hall get the orchestra set up done you know physically be there to conduct pieces like all of this stuff um, having people who are interested and willing to help in all those ways is definitely the top thing. Um, other than that, uh, the big ways that I've stayed involved is that they record all the rehearsals and send them over as soon as they're done. And then mm -hmm. I'll listen through and uh, give additional feedback. Um, try to be nice about it, but <laughs> what what what's typed and what's heard is two very different things um but yeah i would give additional feedback mostly stuff that the conductors who are working on the ground uh will miss mm -hmm. um because they're um our rehearsal conductors are uh instrumentalists first and foremost so they're more concerned about being better conductors than they are about really listening in to what's happening and that's mm -hmm. another thing that happens with beginning conductors is that they're so concerned about what's going on here mm -hmm. that they're not hearing what's going on out here mm -hmm. um and so with that i'm just an, i'm an extra pair of ears for them basically so they can get through the pieces and still fix like major things and then i'll be like clarinets why are you flat <laughs> are mm -hmm. you hearing this are you hearing what i'm hearing no yeah, that was that whole line was just. Um, mm -hmm. I only pick on the clarinets because we have too many of them, and they know mm -hmm. that. Um, uh, so there's that on the admin side of things. It's a lot of um, we use Slack a lot. Mm -hmm. um, like uh, a job I was working on a uh, school I was working for recently, they also use Slack, and they're like, "Oh yeah, we have like five channels." I'm like, "That's cute." My Slack for the orchestra has 30 channels, plus all of these DMs, plus all of this. Also, we now have Discord that we use for online um, rehearsals and stuff as well. So it's like a lot of internet communication. So when the um, when coronavirus hit, we were kind of already in a place where we're like, okay, like we're already doing this. This is fine. Like we can we can function online. We can, we can do this. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of that. It's a lot of um, being prepared to spend late nights uh, with a time difference, um, late nights and earlyish mornings uh, for meetings. Just trying to trying to make it work. It's really if 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 it weren't for the passion for the project, it would not have survived. I think, but I think because of um, me wanting it to be a thing that continues on, as mm -hmm. well as um, the people on the ground who really really find joy in uh being a part of the group uh i think that's what really keeps it going 
So I guess like your function when you're in California, you're you're more like a guide to help them, like run things in in that in that perspective. Um, yeah, like in terms of operations and artistically, yeah, it's kind of like I'm a guide. Um, administratively, I'm still like the head of the organization. I'm still the one who makes the the decisions on mm -hmm. things. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's very helpful for any listeners out there that maybe want to do something similar. Yeah, I think so. Um, the biggest thing is just, uh, honestly, it's just like, um, it's not something you can start from abroad. That's the big thing. Like you have to be on the ground for a while to actually like get things moving. Mm -hmm. so, so start, start on location. And then like, if you have to move, you can help the, the ground team, um, run with the operations. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing that. You're um, welcome. so there's been a, I would say there was like a one, one hour presentation that came out recently on video game concerts around the world. And, um, the video talks about how video game orchestras are becoming more and more popular. And I know that's something that both of us already know. Um, mm -hmm. so I just wanted to get your opinion about the whole, I guess, landscape with video game orchestras. Um, do you think they're going to continue to become more popular? They're going to, there's like more orchestra going to, more orchestras going to continue to form over time. And, um, why do you think that might be? They're definitely becoming more popular. Um, and while my organizations are all community or student run, um, I'm definitely making the move towards a more professional organization in the future mm -hmm. right yeah um so as much as i i'm happy to see video game orchestras continue to be formed and built um it's very difficult to um to kind of stand out from the pack you know mm -hmm. like since the irish video game orchestra started we've had three other orchestras start in the united kingdom since mm -hmm. we were since we started and when i say in the united kingdom i mean like within the last year and a half mm -hmm. we've had three other orchestras start and i mean that's great because now we have these other organizations that we can like work with and we can we can pair up with and if we ever decide to do a tour of great britain hey we've got places to stop now and kind of like uh interact and work with these guys um but at the same time, it's like, you know, if we're all getting our music from the same place, you know, like if we're all using Andres Soto for his video game orchestra score, or we're all renting music from Tommy Tallarico at Video Games Live, mm -hmm. um, like, especially in the age of the internet, what's the point, you know, if we're not all being, as, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I'm happy, I'm, I'm excited to see it, I really am. But I think uh, when you when you start building the group, start thinking about ways that you can be an individual within the genre, mm -hmm. right? What's your take on this? What's your take on this on this music? What's your? How are you guys going to be original? Especially if you want to stand out in a new way, that mm -hmm. um, so that you don't kind of get like mixed up with all the other groups, you know? Um, I know like. Uh, the Washington Metro group, you guys have a bunch of, you guys use your own arrangements and you guys use a lot of, um, you expand on certain tunes and just go way out there. And that's great. Like that is something that no one else is doing. And that's what makes, what makes that orchestra, um, extremely, uh, unique. You can't be extremely unique. That's dumb. Um, but makes that orchestra unique in itself. Um, the IVGO, we're looking at using our uh, uh, using more trad influence, Irish Irish music influence in our in our arrangements, and really trying to begin standing out in our own way that way. Um, it's just like it's just like um, every other classical orchestra, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it's great to have a local one. But there's always going to be like, you know, those world renowned groups as well, right? So then, and they're world renowned because they do something different, mm -hmm. right? So I think um, I kind of jumped a couple of questions on you, but um, I think I think it's great. 
I just think that if we're all doing the same thing, though, what's the point? Like, mm -hmm. let's let's find a way to be individualistic about it at the same time mm -hmm. as being able to support each other. So it's really great. Um, game music in general it has become its own genre and has really grown, and it's becoming its own industry beyond a genre. Um, and so naturally, of course, like uh, in a in a in a world where or in a, in a genre that is so orchestra-based nowadays, um, you're going to have groups build. It's just like having a cover band, basically, just mm -hmm. bigger and <laughs> more difficult to move around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess one of the things I'm hearing is that, um, that like as there's an increase of video game orchestras around the world, there's a need for each individual orchestra to kind of differentiate, have their own identity, and have their own... Um, like I guess music style mm -hmm. or artistic identity absolutely um, to be able to stand up because if you're just playing the same exact arrangement or you're just um, like operating the same exact way there's nothing to kind of differentiate one from another right and so then it's just like oh why do I want to listen to these guys when I have these guys you know it's like mm -hmm. if if you don't have your own your own artistic voice and your own artistic vision it's is it marketable mm -hmm. yeah to, to bring it back around for you it comes back to is, the marketing yeah and beyond beyond just like you know marketing like what we think of marketing but is there a market for it like mm -hmm. absolutely like especially with community groups there's the there's the playing aspect. What do we provide our players? What do we play our, provide our membership? And then there is the what do we provide our audiences? So, I mean, if we're just playing the music, really you're providing for your membership more than you're providing for that audience that you're trying to create. Mm -hmm. Where if you create something that's more individualistic and something more unique, then you're providing for both. You know? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the idea of balancing the needs of both both groups at the same time mm -hmm. honestly oh yeah that's important so um do you have any words of wisdom for someone who wants to start a video game orchestra or for running one don't do it don't run. do it <laughs> run away <laughs> um no what i would say and i say this also for anybody who wants to start who wants to find their start as a conductor just start doing it just do it like right. just do it just start doing it um the the biggest people find that the biggest um barrier to breaking into this is like oh we don't have a place big enough for this this or that my first my first rehearsal with the ivgo was six people in a room that was way too big and way too <laughs> expensive so i mean the the entry into this is just get a bunch of friends together print off some music and just start playing mm -hmm. and the the other part of my words of wisdom is have absolutely zero expectations going in mm -hmm. don't go in expecting to have a concert on this date and it's going to be incredible like guaranteed it's not going to be <laughs> Like, it's just, it, your first concert, unless you've been planning it for months and months and months, um, and you have experience in putting some, like, large events together, you're going to walk away wishing that things happened in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, so, go in with zero expectations, start small, start with people that you know, and let it grow organically. Mm-hmm. You, for so when you guys are starting small, you guys have to find like chamber, I guess arrangements. Um, how did it work? I mean, we actually with the IVGO, we got a lot of our first arrangements from the University of Maryland Gamer Symphony Orchestra. Okay. Um, I was able to email them in, and I forget who the librarian or the president was at that time. They're just like, "Oh yeah, we'll totally help." I'm like, "Cool, thanks." <laughs> And then they sent over the arrangements, and I'm like, I'm going to fix a bunch of stuff because I'm not okay with that orchestration or that or that. Um, 
So it's so, just people helping out. You get really, yeah, yeah. And I mean, most people will help to a certain extent that they can. Um, sometimes it's not legal for us to help out in certain mm-hmm. things. Um, sharing of music is hit or miss on that. Mm-hmm. Um, mainly because of performance rights. If you're playing just to play, cool, we'll hook you up. If you're playing a perfor- on performing something, uh, that's going to be a different discussion. Um, but, uh, yeah, really, it, if you're looking for music, you just either write it yourself, find it somewhere online. I mean, MuseScore has a bunch of stuff, and not, it's not the greatest arrangements, and I have to pay for it. Mm-hmm. Which is actually good because now they're actually paying for rights. Finally, mm-hmm. where have you been, Muse Score? It's been five years. Um, <laughs> so yeah, write it yourself. Muse Score is a great um, a a great resource to start with. Mm-hmm. You may need to fix some things. You probably will need to fix some things. Um, and yeah. then ask around. Like people are willing to help when they can. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thanks so much for your words of wisdom. Yeah. Um, and I have to ask you this question that I ask all my guests. What is your favorite soundtrack or song and game? <laughs> That's the answer I often get. <laughs> um, favorite soundtrack. Um, okay. So the opening theme from Twilight Princess is iconic, Mm -hmm. right, from Legend of Zelda. Um, Although I will say the... Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I (laughs) know. So that's like the epicness. But if you're looking for something that's like kind of uh, understated, quiet, and yet somehow creates such a a firm feeling of nostalgia, even though you don't know where it's coming from, Mm-hmm. Get yourself into Breath of the Wild and take a little trip over to uh, Terrytown, which is one of the one of the quests, one of the side quests, where you have to like build that town in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> but the music, the soundtrack of that section, I don't know what it is, but it just it really just like it has such a firm feeling of nostalgia out of nothing. Mm-hmm. And anytime I hear that track, I'm just like, yeah. I'm feeling things. I'm not going to outwardly show it, but I'm feeling things. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think I think that's probably like one of the top ones for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and game wise, I don't know. Just pick any of the Legend of Zelda games. I'm I'm a Zelda nerd. You're a Everyone Zelda. knows it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, well, awesome. So um, just want to let our listeners know where can people follow you online. Oh, you can find my website at robertlukemartin.com. Um, there's a bunch of stuff up there. Uh, I'm on YouTube. Just search Robert Luke Martin. You can find me on Instagram at Robert Luke Martin. I've got that mm-hmm. media game down, except for my Twitter. My Twitter is Robert Martin IRL. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's... Yeah, that's all of it. And what I'm about... Avail- uh, sorry, uh, what oh, about I was gonna say, your I'm orchestra? available for lessons. Oh, <laughs> um, oh sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I'm available for lessons, even though they're online. I can do it. Um, yeah, the orchestras, uh, the studio orchestra at the Bob Cole Conservatory of Music is found on Facebook and Instagram. Um, just search us, either Studio Orchestra, uh, BCCM, or uh, on Instagram, it's SO underscore BCCM. You'll find us, it's fine. Uh, Ivy Geo Orchestra, uh, yeah, IVGOorchestra.org, or um, on Instagram, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Also, we have a podcast now called Side Stage with the Ivy Geo, which is available on YouTube, mm-hmm. and where all good podcasts are heard. Yeah, I, I checked out um, a little bit of your podcast. This is awesome. The first couple of episodes are rough. We're still trying to like figure it out. Uh, mm-hmm. The Halloween episode just dropped today, and I okay, wasn't on cool. that. I wasn't on that that recording because I was busy. Um, but it is hilarious, and <laughs> um, there is now definitely like two different shows going on. There's there's the audio one that gets recorded, but now there are so many like. Our editor, Lisa, is incredible, and now there are, like, so many sight gags and additional things being added into the YouTube version that it's just, it's a whole nother show. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So I highly suggest finding that and checking it out. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for sharing and thank you so much for your time for today's interview. It's been a pleasure having you, Robert. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll chat next time. Okay. Bye. See ya. You've been listening to the Gamer Symphony Dreams podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Let us know what topics you'd like to hear more about. Until next time, keep living you and your Gamer Symphony dreams.